So really since Napoleon's 1798 invasion of Egypt and the rampant looting of Egyptian objects for the Louvre, which opened in 1804, Europeans had been fascinated by West Asian and North African cultures, a region which they labeled the Orient. Increased trade and travel along with imperial military campaigns and the establishment of colonial settlements accelerated European access to these foreign places, goods, people, ideas, and styles. The term Orientalism is used to describe the European conception of North African, West, and Central Asian cultures in stereotypical ways, giving them either romanticized or negative qualities. Scholar Edward Said described Orientalism as, quote, the colonial gaze upon the colonized Orient, seen as something to possess by the colonizer and as a primitive or exotic playground by the civilized European visitor. Said explains that the concept embodied distinctions between the East and the West precisely so that the West, or Europe, could control and authorize views of the East. Orientalist artworks reflected and shaped European prejudices about the world beyond its own borders. Many European Romantic artists were intrigued by these exotic lands, and several produced works that are sumptuous and stirring, but also rather problematic, sensationalized, and often fantastic scenes of unbridled violence and sensuality. For example, Delacroix's 1827 work, Death of Sardanapalus, pulls from an 1821 play by English Romantic poet Lord Byron, in which Sardanapalus, the last king of the second Assyrian dynasty at the end of the 9th century BC, was besieged by an enemy army, and rather than allowing anything to fall into enemy hands, Sardanapalus ordered all of his horses, dogs, servants, and wives to be slain before him, and all of his belongings to be destroyed. Delacroix's sweeping diagonal composition has been described by some as, quote, an orgy of death in reds, golds, and black. He depicts muscular men in dynamic action, exerting their physicality as they kill the horses with daggers, and idealized nude women in sexual poses who struggle against the men. The only source of calm in the scene is the passive, voyeuristic King Sardanapalus who reclines on his funeral pyre. The figure's turbans, along with the elephant heads and other ornamental objects, confirm the oriental setting of the scene, and Delacroix is seemingly expressing his disillusioned views of those in power who abuse the innocent, yet many European viewers saw works like this as illustrations of these alien regions that did not have morals or restraint, that often reinforced ideas of white European superiority over primitive non-white cultures and became somewhat of a justification for European colonialism, for example, the French conquest of Algeria in the 1830s. Jean-Auguste Dominique Eng, who was perhaps one of Jacques-Louis David's most famous students, was very personally committed to the idea of neoclassicism and to history painting. However, his works are often rather romanticized. Um, Eng sought to synthesize precise drawing, linear clarity, formal idealization, and graceful lyricism with sensually and erotically charged imagery that would appeal to his viewers emotionally. Emotions. Drawing was extremely important to him, and he tended to retain the classical emphasis on defined contours and subtle shading to create an illusion of three-dimensionality within his forms. Um, which he has still done here. However, this particular painting is a very kind of perfect example of this Orientalist style or tradition. Um, this is Ang's La Grande Odalisque that he made 13 years prior to Delacroix's Death of Sardanapalus. Um, he's created kind of careful contrast between the sensual curving contours of the nude female figure and the tight angular folds of the fabric that is crumpled beneath her. 
The woman reclines in this sort of twisting pose, gazing coolly over her shoulder at the viewer. Her face is a classically idealized one with a very sort of calm expression of beauty and poise, but Aang strays from idealized anatomical proportions in the rest of her body. He's lengthened her spine and widened her hips, and she has this impossibly long arm with no joints, and then her bottom leg is in this sort of impossible position as well. These physical distortions serve to accentuate the long, sinuous, curving contour of her body and heighten the eroticism, though she twists enough to maintain modesty. The highly saturated blues are harmonious with her cool, pale skin tone and her blue eyes, um, and the artist is certainly pulling from the Western tradition of reclining female nudes here. However, he is not depicting a traditional mythological goddess or a character from classical literature, but rather a contemporary woman. The justification of such a public display of nudity and eroticism here was that this woman was meant to be from a foreign world where European morale did not apply. The title itself, The Grand Odalisque, indicates the exotic setting, as the term Odalisque was the French term for a harem woman. In West and Central Asian culture, the harem was simply the private space of the women within the household, but Europeans, particularly men, conceived of the harem as more of a collection of female concubines and sex slaves. Ang includes several markers of exoticism here, including the hookah pipe near the woman's foot, the turban that she wears, and the peacock feather fan or brush that she holds, which also serves as a phallic symbol that encourages the viewer to imagine the tactile sensations of the scene, the fabrics, the feathers, and, of course, the woman's soft flesh. Ang really wanted to be a successful history painter, but honestly, he made his name through excuse me, aristocratic portraits and things like this that were aimed at satisfying the male gaze with fantastical women who invited their own objectification, and particularly in this case, also sort of again imply um, European domination over these foreign and exotic places and peoples. Somewhat similarly, Jean-Léon Jérôme's 1879 work Snake Charmer depicts a European fantasy of life in the Islamic world. We see this naked youth holding a serpent as an older man plays the flute, charming both the snake and their audience. The assembled men, whose garments and weapons are derived from a combination of cultures, appear dazed as they watch the snake charmer, and their gaze upon the boy's naked body calls attention to our own gaze. Jerome constructed the scene out of his imagination, based in part on actual places, including Istanbul's um, Topkapi Palace, which inspired the tiled wall, while the stone floor resembles that of the mosque in Amir in Cairo. Um, he utilized a highly refined sort of naturalistic style and very minute detail to suggest that he himself observed this scene, recalling traditional European genre paintings. But in doing so, Jerome suggests that nudity and latent sexuality um, were regular public occurrences within the Orient. Orientalism also manifested in European architecture, particularly due to the romantic interest in faraway exotic places. For example, in 1815, the Prince Regent of England, later known as King George IV, who had Orientalist interests, commissioned the architect John Nash to remodel and expand an existing building into a royal pavilion. Nash's design mixes eclectic references, including ideas based on prints from a six-volume Oriental scenery by English landscape painters Thomas and William Daniel, who had traveled throughout India. The exterior of the royal pavilion features ten minarets and ten onion-shaped domes, evoking Mughal architecture. The structure benefited from radically new cast iron engineering, while masonry, including screens inspired by those of Islamic architecture, concealed the iron skeleton that supports the central dome, as well as the smaller domes and minarets, giving these features a dreamlike floating appearance. 
and I've included this slide so that you can sort of compare this Orientalist style of architecture that was appearing in England and other parts of Europe with the um, Indo-Saracenic or sort of Indian um, European conglomerations that were appearing um, in in regions such as Indonesia with the Hamek Mosque of Kuala Lumpur. In the early to mid 19th century, photographs of foreign people and places were also highly desired in Europe. In the 1840s and 50s, several British, French, and Italian photographers had set up studios in major tourist cities, fueling European popular interest in foreign regions. For Europeans, photography was generally framed as a factual medium that excelled at recording the visible world in an objective manner. However, as we know, photographers created highly constructed images that combined locally specific conventions of representation with increasingly sophisticated photographic techniques, and they did not always accurately or objectively represent their subjects. The truthful nature of this new photographic technology did surprisingly little to contribute to a greater authenticity of representations of the so-called Orient by artists, Western military officials, aristocrats, and travelers. Instead, photographs were frequently staged and embellished, emphasizing the subject's supposedly exotic qualities to appeal to Western imaginations, and many viewers did not question the circumstances or biases behind what they saw. For example, this photograph titled Pasha and Bayader by English photographer Roger Fenton shows a dancing woman performing finger symbols for a man who stares intently while the musician to the left plays his instrument with downcast eyes. Pasha was the title for a man of high rank in the Ottoman Empire, and Bayadir translates as the temple dancer. This was one of 51 images that Fenton made during the summer of 1858 that gives the impression of a domestic scene in the Islamic world. However, these were actually staged in Fenton's London studio. In this case, Fenton and a friend donned turbans to pose as the pasha and the musician, and a dancer was hired as a model for the bayadir. The clothing and furnishings came from various regions and various time periods. A close look revealed strings holding up the woman's arms to help her maintain the pose during the long photographic exposure time. Although critics recognized that Fenton's scenes were staged, they praised him for what they saw as accurate recreations of typical scenes. Such scenes, often featuring women in seductive poses like this one, fed into Orientalist ideas about North Africa, West, and Central Asia. As photographic technology spread around the globe, many photographers served as intermediaries between local populations and foreign visitors, ultimately offering a counter to European Orientalist and colonialist ideas, even if they were not readily accepted by Western audiences. For example, in the 1850s, three Armenian brothers from a merchant family founded the Abdullah Freres studio in Istanbul. The oldest brother studied painting in Venice and later adapted his artistic education to the new medium of photography. At the time, Istanbul was the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and its rulers encouraged the modernization of its army and its educational, economic, and legal systems in an effort to politically unify their vast Muslim territories. Abdullah Freres recorded public works, projects, and educational activities for the Ottoman rulers and catered to members of the upper class. Here, an unknown sitter poses for a calling card, or a carte de visite, a small card left during social business visits to identify the visitor. The sheer veil over the woman's face and hair highlight features, allowing her to exhibit both traditional modesty and modernity. Solid and assertive, she has almost nothing in common with the odalisque of the contemporary European Orientalist imagination. Her confident pose and direct gaze depict a woman of authority and individual presence instead.